Welcome to Advocacy by the Book. Uh, we're going to talk about employment issues for grassroots groups that engage in organizing work. My name is Erica Spangler Raz. My pronouns are she, her. I am Senior Counsel and Director of Pro Bono Works for Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, we work to secure racial equity and economic opportunity for all. We envision a future where all residents, regardless of race, gender, socioeconomic background, have equal access to jobs, homes, education, and opportunity. We, pro we provide legal support through partnerships with the private bar. We collaborate with community-based organizations to craft and implement community-based policy solutions that advance civil rights. And in advancing our mission, we use the full range of legal tools. So that could be impact litigation, direct services litigation, policy advocacy, and also non-litigation capacity building legal assistance to mission aligned organizations and community edu education programs like this one to advance our mission. You can learn more about our work and to request legal, legal support for your organization by visiting our website, www.clccrul.org. Uh, and that is also in the chat. I want to thank the Woods Fund, Conan Family Foundation, and the Field Foundation for supporting Advocacy by the Book educational series, and our pro bono partner, Cypress Shaw, for co-sponsoring this session on employment issues. So recently, there have been increased opportunities for many new or smaller organizations to build capacity and strengthen their advocacy, but it also comes with challenges. So this session, on employment issues is the fourth and final <laughs> workshop um, in our advocacy by the book series. And the purpose of these webinars is to provide information and to help leaders in newer and smaller community-based organizations better understand and manage legal, financial, and operational issues. So the format today is mostly gonna be a moderated conversation walking through common employment law issues faced by community organizing groups. This webinar is participatory and we are here to answer your questions which you can, again, type into the chat in the window throughout. Um, and I'll be happy to pose them anonymously to our presenters. This presentation will be recorded and it will be available on our website and our YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Um, three of them are with Cypress Shaw. And then we have one of our clients and a fantastic attorney um, that will be moderating the session. So. For Cypher's attorneys, we've got Erin Doherty Foley. Erin provides her clients with proactive and practical advice on how to navigate complex employment challenges. She's a seasoned employment defense attorney who understands the importance of preparation and partnership with clients to achieve the right outcome for the situation and for the employer. Patrick Bannon has extensive experience in employment litigation, but also helps businesses avoid litigation by advising them about all aspects of their relationships with employees. And he works in the world of courts and government agencies. Patrick Hart is with the people who try to run fair, productive organizations without being paralyzed by the legal system. And then we have Don Lurie. Don has assisted clients in understanding and influencing immigration regulations and policy by leveraging her political insights and long-term relationships. She's able to effectuate change for her clients and companies and employers look to Don to deliver seasoned strategic counsel as they navigate immigration and compliance legal risk in an increasingly difficult climate. And then finally, we have Carla Altmeyer. Carla's, Carla's pronouns are they, she. She's a mixed race, queer, lifelong Chicago-based activist, attorney, and community organizer working to address the root causes of gender-based violence. As the co-founder and co-director of Healing to Action, Carla facilitates and collaborates with survivor leaders to achieve gender liberation in their communities. In her community organizing, she practices healing justice and emergent strategy to build the political power of survivor leaders. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carla to frame the context of our discussion today and walk us through our common issues faced by community organizing groups. Carla? Thank you, Erica. And it's really great to be here with everyone here today. Um, as Erica said, I am, uh, my name is Carla Altmeyer. My pronouns are they, she. Uh, and I am the co-founder and co-director of Healing to Action. Um, and we really work to build the political power of survivors of gender-based violence. And we collaborate with black and brown survivors, survivors from the LGBTQ plus community, immigrant survivors and survivors with disabilities to address the root causes of gender-based violence and transform their communities. And I think, um, you know, I, as I as I move to kind of frame the issue for today, I want to I want to kind of 
take a step back of like, why do grassroots organizations exist? Like, why do we all exist? And part of it is because the re, you know, we're working with community community groups who historically have not received institutional support from entities like government or other existing institutions, right? Um, and our work often involves building the relationships with communities who are often from some of the most marginalized groups. Um, and we're fighting for things like, we're fighting to create critical changes, right? And so whether it's like fighting to be recognized under the law as deserving of legal protections, or whether it's like sharing your story of harm to shape public policy um, and risking retaliation in the process, right? Um, it's really understanding that like we are working with folks who don't his traditionally have his um, economic or political power and um, and that they also tend to be communities that are coming from that that that, that because of that they're con you know there's like a tendency for exploitation or being underpaid or not being allowed into the workforce or having any pathways to power in those places. And just kind of like an example of how this disparity could play out, right? When there isn't, um, when someone historically like comes from this community and then is trying to do advocacy uh, on their free time, when the free time may not exist, um, is thinking about maybe like, you know, traditional like school organizing, right? When there's parent, or I think we've all heard of like, um, when their parents organize like on the north side, they are able to like fundraise and get like a lot of money and like do whatever they need to do for their kids. But if like parents needed to organize on the south side, it's like, well, parents may not show up and that's because they have to like, you know, they'd have to not work and like they need their job in order to sustain themselves. And so like we constantly are finding ourselves in that position. And I think in the last couple of years, as grassroots organizations, we've become more accountable to the community members we collaborate with. Our analysis and understanding has been that these are groups that, again, historically have been marginalized and have been doing all of the work to carry out the social change that needs to happen. And so for us, it's been thinking about how do we ground, how do we practice our values that, we, that we're trying to promote in the world by ensuring that the people that we're collaborating with feel cared for and have the, um, have the recognition and the monetary support that they need uh, in order to continue to sustain their participation in the movement work. And I think just, just to add here, like with COVID, that became even more evident that as grassroots organizations, because of our proximity and our relationships with community members, we really had to figure out how to provide monetary support um, more broadly uh, in a way that maybe we weren't thinking about or weren't, didn't have the infrastructure to do so. And when this happens, right, and I think even for us as an organization is healing to action, there's a lot of tensions, right? There's a lot of questions and challenges that come up as we're thinking about um, okay, we have this value or we have, we see this need, we want to give money. How do we do that? Right. And so at times it can, um, you know, if we move too quickly or if we don't like think about like, well, what does this, what will the impact be? We can actually jeopardize the existence of our organization, right? Like we can maybe we're, you know, or, um, yeah, we can jeopardize the existence of our organization by kind of falling out of like the boundaries that nonprofits have to navigate. Um, another challenge is actually making sure that we don't impact the community members that we're trying to support in a negative way, right? So whether we're like distributing funds in a way that would then have force them to pay taxes um, or force them to like disclose of, you know, uh, disclose like where they are or, um, you know, if they're receiving public benefits that it would kick them out of the brackets for public benefits. Like those are all things that we also need to be thinking about as we're kind of trying to provide monetary support. And I think the last piece that I just wanted to add here, which is why I so appreciate um, this space being created is because we also are somewhat towing the line of supporting our community members without giving legal advice because we should not be giving legal advice, but that's why we need to, you know, this is where this collaboration with attorneys who have a lot of ex expertise can really support us as an organization to build out an infrastructure so that we're not giving legal advice, but we're creating an infrastructure that's sustainable so that we're addressing some of these needs ahead, 
right? Whether it's like somebody, um, you know, a, a need by a community member or an organizational need. Um, so with that, with that kind of framework in mind, and I don't know, Erica, if you'd like to add anything, anything to that. No, that is great. I think you hit so many really salient points about why these issues are different than the standard, you know, let's go through, you know, is this person an employee, an independent contractor, and why all of those factors in the context matter for organizations that do community organizing work. Um, I think that really is helpful. So thank you for setting that framework. No, of course. And I, I mean, <clears throat> I, you know, so going, go. I think the first thing that, you know, we want to maybe explore a little bit is this, like, just like understanding, like, what is it like, like, what does it mean to give like a stipend or what does it mean to support volunteers? Right. Cause our, our base of members, um, they are considered volunteers, right? They're volunteering their time to part, to do whatever it is, to go to Springfield, to do um, advocacy, to talk to the decision maker. Um, and so um, I think if, you know, so one question I want to pose to the panel of experts here is like, let's say that you are, you know, going, to, you know, that you've received funding and you're able to provide stipends to the volunteers. And these stipends could cover things like a bus ride to Springfield for and food, or the time that a person spent in, in town hall at, at, at a town hall or in a community meeting. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe events like that. And I'm curious if folks could walk us through, like, what is a volunteer? What is a stipend from like the legal definition if there is one? And what are some of the factors that would play into the advice, like the typical advice or analysis that you would give out in thinking through like, being able to distribute a stipend or, you know, um, support voluntarily folks who are participating in these events. Uh, Aaron, is this, I assume this is me. Uh, if it's you, then, uh, okay, good. Uh, I'm Patrick Bannon, nice, nice to meet everyone. Just, okay. I was just gonna pitch it to you, Patrick, go for it. Okay, <laughs> ter ter terrific. Um, I'll, I'll try to give some 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 basic and practical um, uh, thoughts about about those uh, questions that you've um, uh, framed up for us, uh, Carla and Erica. Um, so, in an ideal world, uh, your organizations would be able to do whatever they wanted and pay the people who are doing your good work any way that you wanted, any amount that you wanted, and um, you know your 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 goal is good, so the the, the government wouldn't. Um, wouldn't uh, require you to follow any any of the rules. The rules are really, you know, they were passed for the Amazons and the coal mines and uh, um, you know big big organizations trying to trying to make money. But those rules, unfortunately, do apply to uh, theoretically any organization. So so here's some thoughts about um, about how how you can maybe navigate and minimize the the drag on what you're trying to accomplish and. Be able to help people to the maximum extent without creating uh, extra extra headaches for them um, in the process. Ideally, you'd be able to keep people as volunteers, and a volunteer is anyone who works for your organization without expecting to be paid for it, um, and uh, isn't regularly paid for it. So, the simplest version of a volunteer is someone who just doesn't get paid anything. But you can still be a volunteer even if you're paid in, in certain circumstances, and I'll, I'll talk about that. If the person's not a volunteer, so we want them to be volunteers. That's the best situation because then you can then you can pay them, and and um, you know they're not going to owe taxes, and you're not going to owe taxes because they're volunteers. But if they're not volunteers, then they could be independent contractors, or they could be employees. And I'll talk about that next. So for now, how do you keep them as volunteers? One way to do it is to only reimburse out-of-pocket expenses. So if you have a choice about you, you're going to you want to give someone $150, um, if you could characterize that as reimbursing them for round trip bus tickets and uh, and the cost of meals on a trip to Springfield, for example, to take Carlos' example then you're reimbursing them for their out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and that is 100% consistent with them being a volunteer. 
um, uh, you're just paying them back money that they expended to help you. So you didn't you didn't make them richer. You just put them back where they where they were. If you took the same hundred fifty dollars and just gave it to them and said, "Here's a stipend for for um, for your support. Thank you." It's less clear whether they're a volunteer or not. So first choice would be whenever you can. You can't always do it, but whenever you can, characterize a payment as reimbursing out of pocket expenses. I should have said at the beginning that I welcome questions and comments in the chat. I don't know how the technology works in terms of people shouting at me. If we were live, you could throw things at me and I would, but but uh, I'm happy to have a conversation rather than I'm, I'm on live and I'll try to keep half an eye on the chat. Um, so that's the first one is to try to make it um, uh, reimbursement of out-of-pocket expenses. If that won't work, the second best thing to do, or if that only works partly, the second best thing to do is don't create an expectation or a quid pro quo where everyone knows if you come to the event for four hours, you get you know eighty dollars. If you come to the event for two hours, you get forty dollars. If if they just come to the event and at the end of the event you say thank you very much for coming, this was terrific. Uh, we want to say thank you and here's here's some money. There was no expectation that they were going to do something to get something. Um, and, and so that keeps them a volunteer. Um, you know, you, people say thank you to each other in lots of ways. They send each other gifts and, um, and that's all consistent with them being a volunteer. But if you start giving them specific amounts of money for specific activities and they know ahead of time, if I do this activity, I'll get this money, that starts to seem more like, you know, that's what I do. I come into work, I do specific activities and I hope people will give me money. That starts to seem a little bit more like a job. Um, but then even if that doesn't work, even if you're um, sometimes giving someone money that they expected because your program might be ongoing and you might have something that happens every week. After a while, people are smart enough, they'll figure out, okay, at the end of this event, we get $100 from the, um, from the organization. So you might at some point create an expectation uh, that they're going to get the money. The third uh, and final um, way to keep someone from being a volunteer is to not allow it to be regular enough and significant enough that they become economically dependent upon your organization. Um, I mean, it's a great thing if someone needs financial support, um, supporting them and helping them take care of their financial needs and help their families, so that's a great thing. But if you start doing that, if you become someone's financial means of support in some significant way, and you're providing that support in return for services that they're providing, showing up at events, doing work for your organization, they're at that point going to be um, at least an independent contractor and maybe, maybe an employee. So those are the three things. Try to reimburse expenses rather than just give money to, for, for services or for work. Um, if you do provide money that's not reimbursement for expenses, try to make it so that it's not a quid pro quo. Uh, everyone now knows what quid pro quo is. Uh, People, only lawyers used to know that. Now everyone knows that. Um, and then if you do have to give money that's a quid pro quo, try not to make it regular enough and significant enough that someone becomes economically dependent upon your organization. So I'll stop there because um, I love talking about employment, employment law and things like that, but um, I could go on forever. So I want to uh, see if there are questions or let us move on to the next um, topic. Do, yeah. also in the chat said, uh, do we document the expenses? Absolutely. Um, and that's more of a tax issue, which I know a little bit about. Um, but I, I, I think that documenting the expenses is important to your ability to deduct it. And it's important to your ability to have it not be um, taxable income to the person who gets it. Um, you know, if I pay money and I just get it back from you, that's not really income to me as a basic so I'm not a tax lawyer. Don't go out and change the way you run your organization and get in trouble with the IRS based on anything I say. But generally, uh, uh, documenting the expenses is a good idea if you can possibly do it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to take a particular form. Any documentation is better than no documentation. Um, can volunteers receive a per diem? Um, per diem just means um, you know, a pay for what they did that day. So a per diem, there's nothing wrong with a per diem. Um, but if it becomes every day, um, or if it becomes everyone knows that if you work on a particular day, you get a set per diem, that could start to create this expectation that we, we that, that, I've, that I've been talking about. So um, 
a per diem is just a way of measuring, you know, you, you, you went on a, a trip to this location and you performed these particular services and you spent most of the day. So here's a hundred dollars say, um, you could call that a per diem, nothing inherently wrong with that. But if it starts to be, Hey, everybody, there's a trip, it'll be a hundred dollars each if you go. And then there start to be more and more trips like that. And people go regularly. You're now starting to, um, starting to have people who are working for money um, and they become like your employees. Um, so I'll, I'll now stop and, and, and turn it back over to Carla um, uh, for any follow-up questions she has or, or to move on to the next topic. Um, if, if, if I can just jump in, I'm, I'm sorry, I know that you pointed it to Carla. Um, I was getting some direct messages in the chat. And so um, one of them was, if you're basing it on the activity, you're basing the stipend on the activity, is there any way that it is permissible about basing a stipend based on time? So time volunteering, is that, does that look like paying wages or paying something like that? And then another question was, how do you know, like, does it matter who is the expectation created? The, the expectation of payment, does it matter on the recipient? Does it matter, uh, or like, what are the, what is the risk associated with that? I'm trying to rephrase sure, the sure. question, sorry. Yeah, so sorry, I'm, 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 I must have missed those and my chat must be delayed. Um, no, they were private. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so the second one, the expectation that's important is the expectation of the person who's going to get the money. I mean, it's okay if you know that you're going to pay. That doesn't matter. Question is, did the person who's doing the work uh, know that they were going to get paid? Because um, that's the difference between a gift and, and compensation, right? If I, get, if I get something from you and I'm not sure I'm going to get it. Maybe I think I will. That that's that's not that's not that's not compensation. So if you're creating an expectation of the person who's going to get the money, that could um, uh, make the person more employee-like. And paying the person per hour, um, you know, I don't I don't. It, it's a factor in making them more like uh, more like an employee or more like a contractor and less like a volunteer. Um, so, so I don't, I, it, it's not that that per se is impermissible, but it would be uh, preferable, even if it ends up with some less than perfect uh, justice in terms, you know, someone might be there for three hours, someone might be there for five hours, if they both get the same, uh, you know, you might have to manage that in terms of people's incentives, but um, it would be nicer not to have it per hour, because that starts to seem like quid pro quo, you, you, you work an hour, I give you 20 bucks. Um, uh, and that's not, um, that's not what you want. If you want to say that, I mean, that's not really the way volunteers usually work. Right. Um, uh, so, so first choice, make it expenses. So it's not based on time, even if it's based on the services, try to make it maybe a little rougher and a little bit less, um, input of X hours, output of Y dollars. If you, if you can, um, all of this is against the backdrop of, you know, managing the legal risk is one thing that you're trying to do. And so um, if if uh, if one of these uh, suggestions is going to absolutely be impossible for your program, then, you know, talk to someone about the specifics and what the risk is, because, um, you know, you could just stop doing anything and then your legal risk would go down to zero. But that's not that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. There is one final uh, question in the chat, so I'm just going to read this one. It's about direct cash payments from an organization to a community member in the spirit of guaranteed income or mutual aid. So what are the potential risks associated with that, either for the organization or the community member? Well, if, if you you're know. giving cash to someone to support them because they need help, um, that doesn't in any way make them an employee or an independent contractor. I mean... Um, uh, that's that's a, a a gift or a donation or it's financial support, whatever whatever you want to call it. But if you start doing that in explicit exchange for them, you know, um, helping you around the office or um, what whatever, at that point you're then giving them a job to support them. So those are two different things. And even if your motives are both great in both cases, if you give someone a job to support them then the IRS has some things to say about that and you have to follow some rules. If you're just supporting them because they need your help and your organization is in the business of helping them, then the IRS has nothing to say, say about that from an employment standpoint. Um, uh, so so, so give, giving money to a, to a community member um, 
uh, only becomes an issue if you're giving them money in return for some services. Got it. I think we're good. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Carla. Thanks, Erica. And I'm actually like really glad to hear. <laughs> so I'm thinking through our own structure as we're um, and, and we researched it, but even then I'm still like learning new facts. So this is new information. So this, this is really helpful. So this kind of goes into the second piece, right? We're kind of, we're kind of going to this next issue, which is like work classification. Um, so thinking about like, when does this volunteer become an employee or an, an independent contractor? And then let's say you're there, like let's say you're there. What are some of the factors that, and what are some of the factors in the analysis that kind of go into it? You know, thinking about wage and the, you know, uh, wage and employment laws, like when do you cross that threshold where you need to be thinking about um, making sure that you're in compliance with um, those requirements? Um, what are, uh, what's the problem or what's the risk that you run with misclassifying individuals? Um, and, um, what ha what should you do if you suspect that you've been misclassifying folks for a while? Like, what are some steps that you might want to take in order to address that? Erin, me again, or is this you? I think me again, I, right? I don't want to hog the mic. Uh, you're not hogging the mic. Okay. No, no, no. I, All right, I'll try to be pithier this time, but um, uh, that's a I great- I have a couple of follow-up points when you're done, just from okay. a, a basic sure. employment standpoint, but go ahead. Sure. So, so let's say someone's not a volunteer. So now they're going to be something legally, which is not ideal, but you still would much rather they be an independent contractor than an employee. Um, an independent contractor is just someone that you have a business deal with. You know, like if you hire a plumber in to fix the plumbing in your office, the plumber is an independent contractor. Um, you know, anyone you exchange money with an independent contractor. There aren't very many rules around independent contractors. That's why you prefer them to be independent contractors. There are, there are, there are some, not very many. If they're employees, there are lots of rules, tons of rules. Um, and that's a big, a big pain. So how do you tell which is which? Um, first, first thing to keep in mind is context-wise, I'm assuming most of the organizations that are listening to this, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be uh, high priority targets for a government investigation to try to catch um, uh, people misclassifying uh, in, uh, workers as as independent contractors. So you probably get a little bit um, a little bit more leeway than let's say um, you know some giant um, organization. Um, but the the two and the and the test for who's an employee and who's an independent contractor. I wish the legal system could give people a nice clear test. Um, it's not clear in any way whatsoever. But to boil it down into two practical points that people can keep in mind and, and, and help to make practical decisions, the two most important factors are whether you are controlling the way the person performs the services, that's one, and two, whether the person is economically dependent on your organization. Um, so if you have someone, um, you know, who's doing something for your organization and you say, hey, great, could you design a, a newsletter for us and, um, and send, send that out? And, uh, you know, um, and they're the newsletter person and they know how to use graphic design stuff. And you're, you're, you know, your mission is something different from that. And you say, you know, do the best newsletter you can. I'll take a look and give you feedback. That, that you're not telling them how to do it. You know, you're saying you guys are the experts. I'm not. You do it and I'll pay you that's an independent contractor. But if you have someone in the office and you say, okay, take this stack of papers and, you know, um, well, no one has papers anymore, but um, I date myself, but uh, put this in alphabetical order and put it in that file cabinet over there and then come back and I'll tell you what to do next. Now you're really telling them what to do. And that's, that's more like an employee. So there's, you know, there's as many different flavors of that as there are people and organizations in the world. So there's a million different examples, but the more you control the person, the more they're an employee. And the, the second test of it is the more they're dependent upon you, the more, the more likely they are to be an employee. So if they wake up every, every morning that they decide to work and they work for you and no one else, and they get money from you and no one else, that, that makes them more like an employee. But if they provide, let's just take the graphic design services to your organization and for others, um, that's more like the plumber. You know, today he helps you, today she helps you, tomorrow they help someone else. Um, 
uh, and, and that's independent contractor like. So those are the two main things to, uh, to, to focus on. It is an example where, uh, you know, the, the devil really is in the details. And so if people have specific cases, like, you know, I have um, an accounts payable person, uh, are they an employer or an independent contractor? We spend, a, Aaron and I both spend a lot of our time helping people sort through the specific examples. So we won't be able to give you much more guidance than that in the abstract. After that, it really becomes, um, um, you know, knowing the facts of your specific situation. So I'll stop there and um, uh, let Aaron or, uh, or whoever else uh, jump in. So it looked like there might have been a couple of questions, Eric, if you uh -huh. want to stay with those. And then I just want a couple of follow up points on that. So, OK, let's see. Sorry, yes. I lost track of the chat here. Um, is there an either or both required? Uh, it's not even that clear. The test is not even that clear. I think I would say that if you're controlling the person, probably they're going to be your employee. Um, and if it's not clear whether you're controlling the person, if it's kind of like a little bit, because, you know, even customers control, you know, you might say that's a terrible newsletter, make it more like this. Um, there's always going to be some level of control. So if control, if control is clearly you're controlling it, then they're going to be an employee pretty, pretty much. If control is kind of um, debatable, then I think economic dependence becomes um, uh, decisive. If I had to choose, I would say either one would probably be fatal. If someone's completely dependent upon you for their living, and that's how they get their, their, their income and support themselves and support their families, um, and they don't have any other clients or any other customers, um, that's pretty dangerous to say they're not your employee. Um, so it's close to it's close to either one would be fatal, but I would say that control is more important than economic dependence. Hope that's hope that's helpful. Could I do a follow up question? And I know Aaron, you wanted to add, so I don't. If you wanted to add your point, or nope. one follow up question is, I really appreciate you sharing kind of like the thinking about it from the organizational perspective of like you're either you you know then you have to kind of deal with the the impact of being an employer independent contractor what's the impact on the recipient right like if they if we're behaving in a way where we're like we don't know we're just giving money and and, right. and we accidentally make them an employee or an independent right. contractor are there some right. what's what could what are some potential risks uh of doing that sure sure well if they become an independent contractor um the main thing that happens, and I'm, I'm treading carefully into tax tax stuff, but if you pay them more than $600 in a year, you're going to have to fill out a 1099 form and tell the IRS, I paid this person more than $600 and tell them how much you paid uh, in, in calendar year, uh, you know, 2022. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be income to them, but um, but it, it 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 could it could you know it it could have have consequences to them. Um, if you just reimburse them expenses, then um, you know probably isn't going to be income to them. But you've gotten them on the radar of the IRS. Uh, if they're if they're low income, it may be that they're not going to pay any taxes anyway, and it's not going to be too too awful. But you've got them on the radar of the IRS. Um, and uh, you know, if, and there's all kinds of reasons why people might might not might not want that. So $600, at least as of 2022, at least of, as of the last time I, I checked it is the magic number below $600. It doesn't matter whether it's one payment, two payments, four payments, if it adds up to $600 in that year to the same person, um, then, then you have to send um, uh, 10, 1099. Uh, so if you can keep it under $600, that would be nice. But that's really the only main, that's the only, that's the only problem I can think of about having someone be an independent contractor versus a volunteer um, is you have to tell the IRS that they have money that might be income or might not be. Um, if they're an employee, there's all kinds of consequences, um, uh, which some of which are good for them and some of which are bad for them. Um, uh, the good for them is that they could become eligible for unemployment if they needed it. Um, they uh, get uh, social security uh, paid into the social security system. Some of that comes out of the organization's pocket. Some of that gets withheld from their, um, from their pay. So if they were an employee and you pay the money, you have to withhold from that money. Um, 
uh, maybe income taxes, certainly FICA, you know, Social Security um, uh, taxes, things like that. Um, but there are advantages to being an employee um, uh, in terms of um, uh, being eligible for for certain kinds of um, certain kinds of benefits. Um, uh, you know, Dawn, I'll leave to Dawn the discussion of um, uh, you know the dangers to the organization of having someone be an employee. You, you, there, there's rules about who can be an employee and who can't. Um, uh, that that's in Dawn's world, not mine. Um, so that that's something to think about too. Um, if you're if you're if you're dealing with uh, folks who are undocumented, um, but I, I won't I won't steal Dawn's thunder there. Um, if someone's an employee from the organization's point of view, you have to follow a lot of different rules. You have to get workers' compensation for them. You have to make sure they're not working overtime without getting paid overtime. You have to make sure that whatever you pay them is at least the minimum wage. Um, you have to make sure that the place that they work is a safe workplace. Um, there's um, Aaron and I are employment lawyers. We spend our days, we get up every, every day we think about what are the obligations of employers to employees. There are, there are a lot of them. You have to make sure people aren't discriminating against them. Um, you have to make sure that uh, they get the proper information about how they're being paid um, so that they um, aren't misled or deceived about how they're being paid. Hopefully these people are gonna be friendly to you, but sometimes relationships go sour and the person could later come back and claim, oh, I was, uh, not paid for all the time that I work, um, or the employer didn't keep proper records of my of my working time, or you know I wasn't promoted and this other person was, and and it wasn't it was because of a protected characteristic. So becoming an employee is um, there's good things about it. These laws are meant to help people, um, but from the organ but but it also means with withheld taxes, and from the organization's point of view, it means you really do need to talk to um, talk to an employment lawyer if you don't. Treat them like your other employees if you know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, then then definitely talk to an employment lawyer because there's a, there's a lot that comes with that. Yeah, and I was just going to add, thank you, Patrick. You hit all the kind of the key wage and hour points that I was going to raise. Um, if you do have one or more employee, um, you also have to make sure that as the employer that you've got certain policies and procedures in place. You need to have harassment policies in place. You need to have a reporting policy in place. Um, most of the organizations I think that are on this call are probably small enough that they may not be subject to say Title VII, which is the federal statute. But in Illinois, in Cook County, in Chicago, many times it's just one employee that then puts you under the protection of those particular statutes. So you just, you know, if, if those are concerns that you've not addressed as an organization, Erica can explain to you how we can do a consult with you all to uh, make sure that you have those checks and balances in place for fear to Patrick's point, if the relationship goes sour and then what happens if an employee comes back to make a claim against you in some way. So that was all I was gonna add on that particular point. Just, and one, just one real quick in the chat, someone asked whether the $600 includes reimbursement of expenses. I think it does. Um, I think it does, but... Um, I don't want to get too far out over my skis. I'm not sure, but I think it does. Um, and then someone pointed out that the payroll taxes do cut into the actual money received, and that's and that's true. Um, whereas if you give them, if they're an independent contractor, they get the money, and then the taxes that they owe, that's that's for them to figure out if they owe any. So so anyway, I just wanted to quickly address those two questions in the chat. Yeah, and I thank you so much, Patrick and Aaron, for bringing those points up. Um, I had mentioned that we have an, an inquiry form on our website, so if any of you or those watching the recording are interested in um, receiving a brief consultation regarding your organization's specific situation so that you can talk very uh, with attorney-client privilege and very confidently that that is covered, um, feel free to submit that form and we will pair you up with this, our, our partnership with Cypress Shaw to be able to have that consultation to get your que your questions answered for your specific situation. So um, I'll, I'll put that again in the chat. Um, so with that, I just wanna turn it back over to Carla. Thanks, uh, Erica, and thanks everyone. I think this is this is all really helpful. I have one last question around this, like just this I think, with worker classification, and then I'd like to move into immigration status because I think that's very pressing for many of us. Um, but just generally, there's a lot of organizations, you know, who are fiscally sponsored, 
And so who bears the responsibility, right? In this situation with, with compliance, like let's say you just started and you don't, you don't have those policies, but you're not sure if your fiscal sponsor does and stuff like that. So curious about what kind of employment rules apply? Is there joint employment rules there? Uh, just, just I think the 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 simple the simplest answer to that a little bit glib, but if um if something has gone wrong and someone is bringing a claim saying that you didn't follow some employment rule, um, they are probably going to claim that both organizations are the employer, and the law does allow for that. Um, so if uh, if they work directly for a nonprofit and nonprofit is closely associated with or receives all of its funding from um, some larger organization, be it a foundation or a government agency, the 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 person, especially if they have a, a lawyer representing them, is likely to claim that both are the employer. Um, most likely, it's e it's usually easiest if you if you think of it as like a um, you know, on an organization chart, if you think of it as like levels, if the employee is here, the organization that's most directly connected to the employee that directly pays them, that organization is almost always going to be the, an employer. Um, and, the, and the organization that's above, maybe they're an employer too, but they're probably not going to be an employer instead. So I think you can borrow from them and copy their policies and practices if that's helpful to you. But you're probably not going to be able to say, oh, no, we're not the employer you are. They might be the employer, too. But but I don't think in most situations, if you're the organization paying uh, the, the person and directly, um, uh, you know, organizing and managing their work, uh, then, then you're, you're not going to be able to pass the buck to the organization that's above you in the in the food chain. That's great. And one of the things that I wanted to mention here is that um, we often encourage organizations to make any kind of um, employment arrangements with their fiscal sponsor very clear, both in their conversations, but also in the fiscal sponsorship agreement. Um, and so we also uh, recruit volunteer attorneys to draft those fiscal sponsorship agreements that address these issues as well. You can use the same inquiry form as well. Uh, but employment risk or risk of uh, employer risk is one of the issue areas that kind of come up with fiscal sponsorship arrangements all the time. It's one of like, the, other than the tax issues, um, but the next one is, is there gonna be employees and if the organization, the fiscally sponsored organization grows to the point where they're gonna be hiring employees, then sometimes we need to revisit that conversation, particularly if the fiscal sponsorship agreement was silent addressing employment issues. Um, really, yeah, really great question. Thank you. Yeah, just just real quickly, if it's if, if if you could get the organization that's sponsoring your organization to hire the people as their employees and put them on their payroll, um, that that can only help you. It might it might not work fully. You might get dragged in as the, you're the employer too. But that that might uh, shift some of the risk um, to the to the other organization. So if you can do that, and I don't know if you can. It depends on I guess it depends on a lot of things. But if you can do that, it would be uh, on, only in your in your interest to do that. Thank Sorry. You. No, no. Thank you so much for that uh, for that response. Because again, I do know that a lot of us are still you know might be in a fiscal sponsorship relationship and trying to navigate that, um, that landscape. Um, but I want to move to, you know, in the last like uh, 13 minutes we have here, I'd like to move to like kind of the immigration issues that we might be, um, ex you know, kind of confronting. And so one of the, you know, we know that like we're, you know, let's say we're volunteer, you know, we're, we have volunteers. Do we need to ask people whether they're eligible or is there some eligibility to receive a stipend? Um, and like, is there a specific amount that changes that answer, right? It's an amount of stipend. Um, and then I guess, you know, to kind of tie that piece is like, how do you ensure that the compensation that you give to somebody doesn't create any legal responsibilities for the recipient? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I don't think that there's going to be any difference in all of the guidance that Patrick has already laid out. Um, the immigration service, um, in particular, the legacy immigration and naturalization service, the INS, 
um, which was deprecated years ago, um, put out guidance that basically said that um, individuals who provide services without any expectation of remuneration um, or wages or anything like that. Um, and, and by the way, that includes women and boys and women and um, and um, gifts and things like that. There was an expectation uh, then um, it could be considered a volunteer position. But there was. So in other words, if everyone you know would come to you and would know that they're Every time they come in, they're going to get XYZ for it. Um, you may be crossing over into um, what the immigration service uh, considers uh, something that requires uh, a work authorization. So I'm going to I'm going to distinguish between you know what's an employee and who needs a work authorization. So you may want to go to a little bit of the difference. Um, did this because I do think it's important for folks on the call to understand that even as volunteer um, nonprofit organizations, you still have the same obligations that all employers do in terms of um, completing a form I 9, which verifies the um, employment um, eligibility, um, the authorization for someone to work, as well as their identity for all employees. But the independent contractors do not require a form I 9. So if they are a true independent contractor, I am going to kind of bucket the, the, the volunteer of the UN and the entry independent contractor again, following very similar tests, um, if not the same, because the, the folks have recognized the IRS test and, and, uh, and other similar things. They are considered to be an independent contractor, then no form of time is, is necessary. Um, so, there's no, you know, to answer your question, there's no um, requirement or reason to ask them for their immigration status. As a matter of fact, I would caution you against um, you know, asking someone because why would you be asking based on what they look like, how they talk, accent, you know, type of thing. Why would you ask one group of individuals versus another? So um, I would I would I would um, you know, generally recommend for you know, that you show up along the same. In addition to that for my own that I mentioned um, um, Don, I apologize for interrupting, but I do think that there's some audio issues on your end. Um, we might be having a hard time hearing you. Profits, um, small businesses, doesn't matter the size. So the Department of Justice has an interest in ensuring that um, there is no national origin, citizenship, uh, discrimination, or unfair documentary practices. So while I know that you know, everyone on this call is probably thinking, well, we would never do anything like that. We're trying to help these communities. I point you to a um, recent case where a uh, synagogue in Florida was actually investigated by the Department of Justice um, for requiring certain types of documents for permanent residents. They treated them differently than a US citizen. They asked for a particular document. Uh, when they were hired. So I just, you know, I want to frame that issue. Um, but um, again, getting back to uh, the, the core questions that, that we were talking about, um, I, I think it's important to ensure that um, we are very careful about providing remuneration or in, in any format um, uh, and without somebody um, you know, requiring a work authorization. And this comes up, I don't know if this happens um, for you folks, but I normally hear from the nonprofits with students, students that want to volunteer. You have know, college students, um, and you have a lot of individuals that are actually on, on visas, and they have very specific work authorization requirements. Um, and it really it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not they're getting paid. Thank you, Don, for an answering that question. And I had a follow-up question, but I, you you did answer it around the independent contractor and um, and, 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 and the immigration status there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to now turn it over to, unless if there are more questions, uh, Erica, that you received, I'm going to, well, are in the chat here, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Um, I actually have a question, if possible. Sorry, I'm not Marcellus. I don't know why it's showing up like that. Um, I, my name is Courtney, and we have a grant program where we have uh, kids who are in high school that are getting stipends for volunteering. And I was wondering what they needed, what we needed to do uh, for tax purposes for uh, them to receive the stipend. 
oh, everyone froze. So um, I will confess, I think the three of us from CIFARTH are not formal tax advisors. And so I would be very, uh, to use Patrick's phrase, over my skis or our skis to tell you exactly the types of forms. But if you wanted to provide us with or to provide to Erica some additional details, we can get that question directed to some of the tax folks in our office and we can get you know a more complete answer um, rather than just an off the cuff because taxes and off the cuff don't match. I don't want to <laughs> don't want to give you the wrong advice on that. So yeah I can give some bad advice but that probably wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna. I was actually gonna jump in. So thank you, Erin. Yeah, um, happy to help see if we can figure out what the right route is for your organization because I think we're probably gonna need a little bit more background and facts. I put a link to our inquiry form. You should feel welcome to fill that out, and we'll see if we can help you. Um, there was one more question that was put in the chat um, that was about do paid interns or stipend receiving interns qualify as employees or volunteers? Um, I think. Patrick may have answered that. I don't know if it matters if, if it's an intern or not, um, but I think that we went through the employees versus volunteers versus independent contractors. Patrick, might you be able to address any exceptions for interns? Sure, there is. A, there has been a lot of um, there have been a lot of legal fights about whether interns have to be treated as employees. You know. Um, and if someone's an intern and they're not paid at all, so the fight is, am I supposed to be getting paid? Um, and the test there is, is this internship mostly benefiting the organization or is it mostly benefiting the intern? And a classic internship is for, for an educational purpose. You know, if you're at a school, high school, college, whatever, where part of the degree is to um, shadow someone who is actually doing what you're studying to do, um, that could be beneficial to the person who's doing the shadowing, the intern. Um, and the person could actually be kind of, um, you know, take up a lot of time of the organization. So, the, so in deciding whether they're really an employee or really an intern, the test is, is this mostly helping the person doing the work or is it mostly helping the organization that's receiving the, the, the services that that's often very gray and that's why it gets fought over a lot if you pay the person uh then we're back to the discussion we had before is it for expenses or is it for their time is it uh, a quid pro quo where they knew what they were going to get in return for what and is it regular enough and significant enough that they become economically dependent upon your organization even if it's for a couple of months um so so um so the intern intern versus employee is a version of the volunteer versus uh, versus employee. Um, and the main way that it would be a little bit, you might have a stronger argument than you would for a regular volunteer if there were some educational purpose uh, motivating the internship. Otherwise, you're just under the general test for volunteer versus employee. Great, that's thank the way you. I see it. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, it looks like we are running up on time and I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I just wanna thank all of our presenters today for sharing their expertise. Um, Aaron, Patrick, Don, and especially Carla for leading us through all these common questions faced by community organizations. I wanna extend our thanks to the Woods Fund, Conant Family Foundation, the Field Foundation for supporting this educational series and to pro bono partner, Cypress Shaw for co-sponsoring this session on employment issues. For everybody attending, we're going to email you a link for this recording, a short FAQ publication about employment issues. And I will also include, again, the link to request a brief advice consultation on our employer hotline, which is a signature pro bono project with Cypress Shaw. We encourage you to share these resources and the recording with board members or even other organizations that may benefit from this session. And of course, we're here to support you. Feel free to contact us through our website um, or reach out in any other way. Thanks for joining us today.